Okay, there's plenty of room, there's plenty of room, even though uh, we have a packed house. So let's uh, kick off uh, our uh, second seminar in the Alan Turing Centenary series uh, that we will be holding here at uh, Reykjavik University in this room, I believe, uh, probably all the time. Uh, this is our second talk, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Emir Vigdusson, who joined us uh, a few months ago uh, <laughs> from uh, sunny Haifa, where he was working at uh, IBM uh, Research. Well, well you, you hear people say, uh, sort of, sunny this place, or sunny that place, typically that place is not sunny at all, but in this case, uh, Haifa is definitely uh, a sunny place. Uh, Emir is going to tell us about uh, Alan Turing's work uh, on uh, code breaking uh, and his role uh, as uh, the man who won the Battle of Britain. We like to have the theatrical titles in this series to attract as many people as possible. But this is uh, not a crossover statement of the role that uh, Turing played. Uh, but as always in science, uh, it's not that somebody comes and uh, does uh, work uh, in a vacuum. Turing also stood on the shoulder of giants of sort, like Isaac Newton would have said, and uh, Emir, I know, is going to tell us uh, on what shoulders uh, Turing stood on. Uh, let me also remind you that we tape all of these talks, uh, so uh, you will be able to relive them later on at home and make other people listen to them. Okay, please do so. Emir. Thank you very much, Luca. So as you can see, we have uh, two projectors here, so I hope you all brought the 3D goggles, because this is going to be entirely in 3D here. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about Alan Turing, uh, the man who won the battle for Britain. But uh, really, what I'm going to do is to talk about three men. I'm going to talk about this English guy, who was a polymath, logician, and other things. I'm going to talk about this uh, mathematician from Poland. And I'm also going to talk about uh, this inventor from Germany. And they're also linked by a machine called the Enigma machine that I'm going to detail. And if that doesn't, isn't interesting enough, we can try to spice it up and say that there's war and there's ships and there's submarines and all this stuff. So there's a lot of pressure going on. So we're going to just put it into like this historical context, what was going on. Okay, so let's uh, go back a few years. So to 1899, when uh, there was this guy who discovered that he could send uh, communication over radio. He could like, magically put something on the power and it, was, it would reappear as Morse code somewhere else. And uh, this was a very tantalizing prospect for the military because this is both desirable, you can now communicate with all your minions far, far away, but so can anyone else, right? They can listen to your communication. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. So um, we need, uh, if we want to send a message to our troops, right, there's a war going on, we need to somehow encrypt it. We need to make sure that the other side can't understand what we're saying. So this uh, created kind of a, a spur in this field of cryptography. And uh, during the First World War, from 1914 to 1918, there were many, many, many wartime ciphers that were used. Like every other person would be like, I have this encryption machine here, or like I have this cipher that can be used and it's unbreakable. And then like two weeks later it would be broken. And uh, everything would be red and everything would be uh, kind of a... <coughs> a big debacle. So um, we call these people that uh, decrypt ciphers that somebody else invents, crypt analysts, or we're going to call them code breakers today. And as a famous example, in the First World War, there was this cipher that the Germans were using called the ADF GBX cipher. I don't know exactly why, but it has this sort of very nice name that's easy to say, but uh, it was broken by the French. There was this guy called uh, Paul Mion, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, but he spent like two months, like a really focused effort, lost 15 kilos, and he like just worked on the day and and realized that he could in fact uh, decrypt the messages. And so he figured out where the Germans were keeping their, um, uh, where, where they were going to have their surprise attack come from, and removed their element of surprise. And this was in fact one of the reasons why the war ended so early. 
So really what had happened, like up to this point, if you just go through history, is that uh, there was a code that came out, and then there were people that would uh, be able to break it. For instance, uh, if you just look at regular cryptography, where you just take um, any alphabet and you like put this random images, or you, you shuffle the characters. You do something that like everybody does when they're like 10 years old. That's something that can be defeated rather easily. It had been defeated in like the 1400s by the Arabs and many other uh, places in history. So by this time, in 1914 and 1918, the code breakers had the upper hand. There was really nothing that anybody could come up with that couldn't just be broken in a period of time. So um, something that sort of highlighted the impact of this crypt, uh, crypt analysis happened in 1917, which was right before the war ended, so the war hasn't ended yet. There was this foreign minister, whom the uh, Americans really liked, called it Zimmerman, who was, um, he, well, so the Germans apparently had accidentally uh, downed a big cruise ship, like a cruise liner, American cruise liner, and there was a lot of American citizens that died, but uh, the, uh, the United States was still neutral in World War II. So this guy was like, oh no, no, we're just gonna, like, now whenever we attack uh, boats, we're gonna have our submarines come up. And then he decided that he was gonna actually back out of this treaty that they had made with the Americans, and, but he didn't want to um, make the position so that the Americans would be drawn into the First World War and held the Allies. So he, he had, had to somehow uh, have some sort of element of surprise so that, um, so that the Americans wouldn't be drawn into the First World War. And so what he did was to say, okay, let's talk to the Mexicans and have them attack the US. So this is something that happened in 1917. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. So he needed to talk to the German ambassador in Mexico, and he sent him a telegram. And of course, he couldn't just send him a telegram, hey, you guys want to attack the US? So he had to encrypt it somehow. So he encrypted it as follows. This was uh, using, I think, one of their famous ciphers. And as it turns out, um, the code breakers in the First World War, which were predominantly French and uh, British, intercepted this message. Why did they intercept it? Well, it's because one of the first acts of World War I was that the French severed all the transatlantic cables that Germany had. And so they always had to relay it through like Sweden and Britain or some other cables. So everything that was being said and done by the Germans in the First World War went through Britain and went through something called Room 40 where they were trying to crack all the different ciphers. And they intercepted this telegram and they cracked it relatively quickly and figured out that, whoa, <laughs> this is serious stuff. This is probably going to draw the United States into the war. And so what they decided to do is like, okay, so what, what, what can we do? We can talk to the US and say, okay, so you, we have this message. We know that uh, they're planning to have the Mexicans attack you guys. Clearly this is an act of aggression. Can you guys help us out? But if you do that, then you also reveal that you're able to decrypt all the messages that are being sent. So what they did was to be like, okay, let's, uh, let's uh, wait a little bit. And uh, uh, let's just see if, if, the, if the fact that, the, that there's going to be an attack is just going to draw the U.S. automatically into the fight. And so an attack happens, and the U.S. is like, no, we're just going to stay neutral. We don't want to sacrifice the blood of our like, young generation on this war in Europe. And so, um, they decided to uh, take up this telegram. And I was like, okay, so how are we going to get the Americans to actually join us? So what they did was to go to, uh, uh, they sent like an agent to Mexico to intercept the, the, the sort of the relayed, um, the relayed telegram, which had already been sent there, and sort of made it look like it had been intercepted by the Americans in Mexico. And then they sent out like all these messages in the papers, like, why did you fail? Like, the, you British code breakers, why did you fail to intercept this message? And so they essentially just framed the, uh, the situation as if like the Americans had, had the upper hand to decrypt this message and that the British were completely unaffected by, in fact, completely incapable. And the Germans fought this, which was kind of interesting. So this eventually was sent to President Wilson at the time, and Wilson was like, okay, this is the hardest thing I've ever had to read, but I'm not gonna enter World War I. And, the rest is kind of history. So, um, World War I ends in 1918, and uh, the Allies win, and uh, in large part due to their superior code-breaking abilities, the Germans, in fact, didn't even have a code-breaking bureau or anything until like 1916 or something. They just didn't think about this. They just went into war. Whereas like the French and the British were like, they were sort of driven by this fear of this aggression that was happening from the East and uh, decided that they needed to have an ability to read messages. So um, 
Well, as I said, most of the ciphers had been broken or they were impractical. In fact, somebody had invented a perfect cipher, but having a perfect cipher, something called a one-time pad, involves that you need to have just as many random characters as the letters that you want to send. And so you can imagine a battlefield where you're just carrying around all these documents and you just like, okay, okay, we can send a message here, but oh, I'm out of random characters. We need to get another carrier like, to, to bring us more documents so that we can actually send the message. It's kind of a, it's a, it's a permanent approach that's used for, for instance, like the telephone cable between Russia and the US, one time cipher pad, but it's impractical on a battlefield. So there was a solution, but not a practical one at this stage. So along comes this guy that I showed a picture of earlier. He was this German inventor who uh, was working on turbines and various other things, and his name was Arthur Scherbius. And he wanted to address this problem and wanted to mechanize encryption. Essentially, he wanted to bring this encryption element to the 20th century and take all this new technology that was coming. So he um, did something that many others at the same time uh, tried to do, which was to get the um, superpowers interested in uh, this kind of rotorized encryption. So you would have like a, a, a rotating um, dial that would be the mechanical encryptor. And um, there are stories of like three others that tried this like in the US or in France and so forth. And they all like asked the government, like, well, look, I have a machine and uh, it can encrypt stuff and it's, it's not very expensive. And uh, after the world war ended, everybody's like, nah, I mean, things are great now. And everybody's friends. And so there's there nothing done at the time. The machine that he developed was called the Enigma machine. And little did he know that, in fact, even though only a few businesses ended up buying it and it was kind of a commercial failure, it would end up being the most fearsome system of encryption in history. And we're going to talk about what this machine really did. So um, nothing really happened until 1923 when Churchill finally got permission from like the Royal Navy and other places to be like, can I please write a book about the world problem? I really want to just talk about what happened. So he writes a book that has like this very dramatic account about how how like they they got the information, how they managed to uh, decrypt the encryption from the Germans in the first place, which was to uh, there was this I think uh, uh, Churchill described it as there was some Russian guy who went and like pried it out of the hands of the strong soldier of the boat and blah 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 blah. There was like this code books that had to be destroyed whenever there was this, whenever something happened then. The Russians obtained the book and uh, sent it to the British, and the British were able to break the book. Um, so he wrote an account about all this, uh, how this happened in 1914, and how, in fact, all the communications from the Russians were transparent since then. And uh, the Germans were not very happy to read this book. You know, meant to do a, a report. They were, in fact, shocked to see the state that, in fact, everything they had been doing had been monitored so closely by the enemy that they were effectively playing open cards with the British command. And so they, they had previously been approached by Sherbius with this Enigma machine and said, no, we don't need that. And then, uh, well, in 1925, they ordered tons and tons and tons of Enigma machines. They found out this was exactly what they needed. It, is, it was like 12 kilos, but uh, Sherbius would go on and produce 30,000 of these. And this is how much they would buy over the next two decades. In fact, Sherbius never actually got to see how it got used, because he died in a worse carriage accident in 1929. But oh, by then, all the factors and stuff to make this uh, cipher had already been established. So let's talk a little bit about what the Enigma really is. And I'm going to sort of dig into the details and kind of construct it so that we have an understanding of what all the elements in it really do. Not all the elements, but most of the important ones. So this is the machine itself. It's really a typewriter. And when you click a letter, the one of the bulbs illuminates. And so if you click like a P, maybe like B illuminates, and that means that the code you should be sending over more should be B, and that's encrypted. And it has a number of settings that we're going to discuss, which can be modified so that you have encrypted communication. Okay? So really we have here input and output. It's really that simple. So if you think about how would you create a mechanical uh, machine like the Enigma? Well, you could think about that you had like this kind of a dial or some way in which you could like uh, move the letters that you type so that they go to a different letter. So, for instance, if I press the B on the keyboard, then maybe A illuminates because it goes through some path. Okay, so this would be the simplest thing you could do, right? What's the problem with this? So this is, uh, let's just think that there are only six letters in the alphabet and that this is the entire world. How would you go about breaking this? 
Let's think about that further. Anyone? Exactly, you do frequency analysis. So this is called the scrambler, this thing in the middle, the thing that sort of uh, permutes all the letters that you uh, input. So you would do, this is normally called the substitution sampler. It is in fact precisely the one I mentioned earlier. It's the one where you just take a letter and you replace it with any other letter. And it's always the same thing. And it turns out that even though things look a little random, if you look at the distribution of the different characters, for instance, if you look at the English language, then if you just look at how often the, the letter E appears, it appears way more often than any other letter. And the next letter after that is T, and so forth. And so if you now just look at whatever random symbol has the most uh, predominance in the ciphertext, and then the next one, it's likely that the most predominant letter is in fact E. So you replace it with E, and then you do T, and so forth. So it's a really simple process. It's been understood for centuries. And, uh, understood by those who knew how to break it. There are lots of, like in the American Civil War and stuff, they were still using this stuff. Um, anyway, so this is a really simple thing. So we want to somehow bypass this vulnerability. Okay. So let's do something that, um, so definitely Sherbus came up with an idea. Let's make this scrambler be like on a wheel and let's make it rotate. So that when you click a letter, then the thing moves down, and you now have a different scrambler assignment. So the next time you click B, it goes to a different letter. Okay? So now we're going to rotate, and we're going to rotate six times, because there are six letters in our, in our alphabet. So the question now is, can you break this encryption? This is also known as polyalphabetic sound. How would you break this? Any? Maybe down to six substitution cycles, if you know how many. Yes, exactly. You would, in fact, take every sixth letter in the messages you you're reading and do exactly the same thing as before, because every six letters, you will have a full rotation in the script. It's pretty cool, huh? So, the thing is that, so here's the rotor, just to show you a picture here. You have this rotor, after six clicks, it's back to the initial position, and thus we have the same type of encryption. Okay, so, Sure, we have more ideas, okay? So well, why to stop a long scrambler when you can use more scramblers? It's like the first rule of government spending, like why buy one when you can buy two twice the price? <laughs> okay. So uh, so he, he just said, well, why don't they have three scramblers? And so three scramblers essentially was kind of the limit of like the weight. It was already 12 kilos, he didn't want to put many more than that. But not just have scrambles that rotate randomly, but kind of like the odometer of a car, you know, the uh, thing that counts your kilometers. So that when you click C and it goes through this thing here, then only one of the scramblers rotates a little bit. Like only the rightmost one here, scrambler number three, rotates by one click. And when it's done with one full rotation, the next one rotates by one. Okay? So they're all going to rotate just a little bit, just like you would count in a, a, in a meter, like an odometer. So that's pretty cool, huh? So we have now. If it's six letters, it's like six times six times six combinations before we have repetition. For a full alphabet, like 26 letters here, this would be something like 17,000 uh, combinations. Can you break this encryption? Anyone? Especially in, at the time this, was, this came out, which is in what, 1918, right? It's kind of hard to break this. It gets, it gets a little bit bad. So you have all these combinations, and you could... Um, you could try to think about, well, let's take every 1,700 character and uh, take them together. But of course, messages were never that long, right? So it gets a little bit trickier to do that. But um, you could do something else. You could try all the different initial positions and just see, okay, if I try position A, 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 or something like that for the scramblers, do I get a message that makes sense? Oh, no, I don't get a message that gets makes sense. Let's try A, A, and B, and so on and so forth for two full weeks, one minute of time. It will take a while, but it's still two weeks. So it's moderate security. And in fact, if you had like 12 guys or 14 guys working in parallel, you could do it in a day. So it's still not powerful enough, okay? So we're going to add a little bit more to this. We're going to, so what I did now was to take this, uh, this panel here that lights things up, and I moved it here to the, to the left here. Nothing really changed, except I added a little piece here, which is called a reflector. It's this green piece over here. What I'm doing right now is not has nothing to do with really the encryption abilities of the machine. It's just something that makes it easier to use because, as it turns out, if I encrypt stuff, 
I still also want to be able to decrypt it using the machine. And if I want to decrypt it into the machine, it should be that if I have the same settings set up, then if I press E and I encrypt E and uh, the letter F illuminates, and I transmit F over the radio, then the guy on the other end should be able to type F and see that it was actually E that I intended. We want, we want symmetric encryption and decryption. So really what Sherbius did here was to add this reflector here, which just receives, um, receives uh, whatever the signal came out of the last scrambler and transforms it to some other guy and then sends it back throughout a path and illuminates alike. So we didn't really change the encryption now, we just made it easier to use. Okay? This is fine, right? Okay, so we have this component called the reflector. And now we're going to address the final shortcoming, the fact that we only have these 17,000 combinations, which is still plenty, but we can do a little bit more. We're going to add something called a plug board. And the idea behind this plug board is that you, just, you can say, okay, A is now mapped to T. You can just draw a wire between them. And you can say that C maps to B. And you can do all these random pairs. And in fact, um, for the longest, they just have the six pairs uh, plug board that would um, kind of be permuted. So we're swapping pairs of letters. So this thing here actually increases the combinations substantially. So how would you break this encryption? Well, this is kind of what the uh, Alice were up against. This is kind of the final state of the Enigma machine as, as it was presented. So if you look at the number of combinations here, we have these scrambler orientations for 17,000. We could also take the wheels, the scrambling wheels, and we could put them in any order. So we could put them in six different orders, like wheel number one, two, three, or one, three, two, two, one, three, and so forth, right? And we could put six pairs of letters in this plug board to scramble them, and that's another like 100 billion combinations. So in total here, I have a number here that I can't really pronounce. That's the number of combinations that we would have to try just in order to be able to find the right initial set for the name. It's pretty bad, huh? So this is a machine that really upped the ante and was a really significant factor um, when the Second World War started. But let's get to that. So let me just show you the machine kind of in use. The millions of permutations are achieved by the number of variables involved when setting up the machine. At the height of the war, German operators change these settings every day. They place the rotors in a specified order from left to right. The rates that allow the rotors to turn are repositioned daily, as is the patch power of cables electrically linking one letter to another. These variables make the enigma encryption virtually immune to frequency analysis. The Germans think their enigma code uncrackable. They believe no one has enough time or the mathematical ability to work through the millions of combinations. Okay, so that shows the, uh, the machine in action. So let's now step aside a little bit and look at what's happening in the context in Europe at this time. So in 1926, that's when uh, the British crypt analysts uh, should be here, they begin to uh, notice that they're getting very strange uh, messages. Messages had like very few vowels, and it's really strange. And they were like, "What's going on?" And um, they quickly saw that there must have been some mechanized cipher. They in fact suspected that that might be the Enigma from Sherby because they knew about his commercialization of the product. And they just looked at it. They saw how many combinations there were, and they're just like, "We can't do that." And if you think about it, they're kind of in a position where they had already like won the First World War. Germany had lost. Germany was paying lots and lots of money because they lost the war. They're kind of overconfident because they're so good, and they didn't really need to decrypt. So there's no immediate need to decrypt this machine. So it was kind of an overconfidence in the wake of the, of the First World War. But there was one country that kept its toes. It was kind of kept on its toes. It's because it was in a position that wasn't exactly comfortable. So uh, if you think about it, if you were Poland that just got independence, just like after, like sh shortly before the First World War, and you were kind of in a position where like Germany had been split between like, essentially Poland was split from something that previously belonged to uh, the Soviet Union or like Russia and then Germany. It was kind of like this 
two supercars are like compressing it from both sides, you're kind of sandwiched between two different ideologies. You have the Nazi regime, and then you have the uh, communists that are eager to spread their uh, uh, propaganda. They're kind of in a position that I wouldn't want to be in. Okay? So they were like, yeah, we should try to uh, decrypt it. Okay? So uh, what happened was that in 1931, the French spies actually obtained a blueprint of an enigma. They actually got it from this disgruntled German who uh, had a factory, but he lost his factory because of hyperinflation. He was pissed off at his brother, who was very successful. So he decided to just give the Allies like uh, blueprints of the Enigma, because he was working at the Cypher Bureau. And, um, and he could get them back at his country, back at his brother, and he also got some money. So it was a good deal. This was uh, Hans Timo Smith. Um, so he also got the German military operations manuals. So the French one knew what to do. And they looked at it and was like, this is useless. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so uh, they had this uh, pact with the Polish that they would, uh, that if something really happened, um, or like if there was any intelligence that they would get, they could like, share it. So they just got this stuff and they were like, I don't know what to do. So they just gave it to the Poles. The Poles were like, yeah, we'll take a look. Um, and so what they learned from this manual was that the Germans, when they were using the machines, would issue day keys. They would issue like every day, all the settings would change. And so there was like this large code book for every day that included what should the scramblers be oriented as, like what should be the letter that's facing up, what should be the order or arrangement of these different scramblers, and also how should you configure the plug. So this changed every day. Okay. And so if you think about it here, here's the thing that goes up, this is the order of the wheels, and here, like underneath, is the plug board, and you would get the information about that. This letter should connect to that one. Okay? So that's every day. And in addition to that, they would have message keys, which means that for every single transmission made by the Enigma machine, you would start by just saying, you would start with your day key, just the, the, the standard settings, and then you would transmit uh, a message key saying, okay, STZ, and then you would type STZ again, just in case uh, the message was lost, or like it, you, would, for, you would have this redundancy just in case something was uh, went missing, and then what would happen was that you and the person who would be receiving it on the other end would change the settings of the machine according to that key. So they changed the, would turn the wheels until they said STZ, and then they would start saying Achtung, or whatever they want to say, right? Okay. So this repeat here of the key is just to ensure proper transmission. So that's the message key. Why did they do this? Well, if you think about it, this really defeats frequency analysis. So even if you're using a day key to send millions of characters, you can't really do any, anything meaningful. Even if you knew that, you were, that the Germans must be saying Achtung, you can't even go back and try to figure out, okay, what was the day key be? Because all you had was seemingly random characters being sent, six characters for every transmission. That's like a, only a few thousand characters per day, even if you send thousands of messages, that you could use to try to build up what are what the settings of the Enigma. So it made it really hard to attack, right? So this is kind of why all these uh, guys gave up, like the Americans, the British, and the French were just like, uh, I don't know what to do. So um, the Poles, of course, they thought about this and like, okay, we need to uh, do something, we need to step up. And so they found this uh, university in like the German-speaking part of Poland. It wasn't the best university, but it was one that was kind of uh, far away from kind of an invasion site uh, in Poland. And they had, had people that tried their kind of mathematical abilities, and they recruited um, some math students that were promising to something called the Bureau Cifro, which is the cipher bureau in Poland. This is one of the first agencies ever to use mathematicians. This is kind of interesting because um, what had been used up to this point were predominantly linguists and people good at passwords and so forth. So one of these guys was Marian Rijewski. And this is the second guy in the picture I showed initially. Um, this is actually uh, him in 1932. And he found a major weakness in the Enigma. And let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the brilliance is how he exploded. So, notice that when we sent the message, we repeated it, okay? We repeated it because it could get lost, like if we didn't get a repeat of the message, then something was wrong, and we, we knew that we had to retransmit, okay? So what he saw was, okay, so we have all these, like if we were just listening to these codes, we have all these um, original messages that are starting with the same 
uh, with, with like three characters and then repeated three characters. And when it would be typed in on the machine, the Enigma machine, it would probably look something like this, like L O K R T M. It would be uh, essentially garbage, right? It would just be a series of letters that didn't make any sense. But we would know that the first character and the fourth character were one and the same. We pressed the same thing on the Enigma machine to get the first one and the fourth one. And what had the machine done between those characters? It rotated the scramblers by three settings. Same thing is true for the second and the fifth, third and the sixth. Okay, so this is a very curious thing. Now, how do you use that for anything? And that's where the kind of brilliance came in. Okay, so let's look at just the first and the fourth for now. So we're going to look at that, in fact, L is somehow intimately related to R, because I press the same key, namely, in this case, S, using some date key and some message, uh, some date key, to get L, and then few settings later, I got R, okay? And the same thing happened when I had M and X, J, M, D, P. So I'm going to just take these letters and I'm going to put them up in, uh, in a different table here. So I'm just going to focus on that. So I have here, L is connected to R, M is connected to X, J connected to M, D, P. And if I was patient enough and I got enough transmissions from the Germans, I would be able to complete an entire table here, which would be that some letter here would then Three letters later be repeated as something else. So G would be repeated as O. Okay, so far I'm just collecting information. Nothing really interesting has happened yet. But if we now look at this thing as a permutation, we see something interesting. Let's try to find a look. Let's, let's just look at A here. A is linked to F. And F is linked to W. W is linked back to A. So we have some sort of loop. And so what? Okay? So we have this loop here, and we can in fact do the same thing for all the other letters and find that all the letters can be explained in these different chains. Okay? Well, it's, it's curious, but what's interesting about it is that is the length of these link, of these chains. So in this particular case, we have one chain that's of length three, one of length nine, one of length seven, and another one of length seven. And what's what Marachevsky found out was that these links are unaffected by the plug board. If you think about it, if I now plug in, if I use the plug board and I transform some letter, let's say I transform the letter K to T on my plug board, nothing changes as far as the lengths of the chains goes. All that happens was that the two letters were interposed. In other words, he nullifies the effect of the plug board and that was the plug board that made most of the variation possible. Okay, so effectively what we have now is a machine that we can just start thinking about the combinations that are left over when the plug board is not there and try to think about what possible scramble orientations and scramble arrangements could make these chains of lengths 3, 9, 7, 7. And it's, uh, if you're interested in the mathematics of it, if you write something as, um, as a, a permutation, Really, when you do conjugation, you preserve the length of your chains. So that's really what the Enigma machine does, just for those who are mathematically curious. So this is a theorem, then, in fact, that he proved. Okay, so now we have 100,000 entries left. So what would you do next? Well, he just looked at every possible, uh, every possible combination and just wrote, what is the chain length that we see? And then every day, what he could do was to say, okay, um, I see all these messages, and I see these chain lengths, that must mean, let me look up in my book, look in the book, and you see, oh, it must mean that the settings are these. And then you just fix for the plug book, which was actually easy, because you just have some letters that didn't make sense, and you just interpose them. Okay? So it's only 100,000. So this is really started a golden age for Poland. It's a really clever trick that he played there. Okay. So he enumerated all the possible settings, he wrote a map, and then uh, the Germans kept evolving the Enigma. The Enigma was just a static thing. They would poke it, for instance, they would add more wheels or they would change something in it. And so once in a while, like all this stuff that he'd been writing for a whole year was his obsolete. Like you would have to start over. And he was like, yeah. So he created something called what he called a bomb bar, which is a mechanical way to enumerate these things. So essentially he had he had created a lookup table or in like 1930 something. Um, so 
the result of this is that the uh, Polish are actually able to read all the German communication from 1932 to 1933. And there's actually a catch here, which is the fact that you remember the spy I told you about earlier, the Schmidt guy? Well, he didn't just give the, the Germans the Enigma codes and so forth. He actually gave them all the fake keys for that period of time. But the guys at the cyber bureau just put it in the drawer because they didn't want to be reliant on it. They could have had read all the communications, but they just didn't tell them uh, Rajewski. So he just said, no, we can't read it. So Rajewski worked hard and worked hard and <laughs> decipher all this communication because they wanted him to be self-sufficient in case Schmidt would uh, I don't know, be found or if, if something would happen. So they wanted uh, him to, it was remarkably astute. Um, but then the tide takes a turn. Um, in 1938, the Germans decided to boost the Enigma security, and quite substantially. They, instead of having three scramblers that you could have, you could, have, you could choose from three from a set of five. So you added two more scramblers, and you could use scrambler number four, two, one, or something like that. So now you had 10 times more combinations that you needed to try. And if you wanted to build more of these bombers, that was like 10 times the annual budget for the Bureau Cycle. So it was kind of infeasible for them. And then in uh, April of 1939, Hitler withdraws the non-aggression treaty with Poland. Uh, and uh, let's just say that it creates kind of a panic situation in Poland. So they decide to, uh, in June, they call up like the British and the, and the French and say that, yeah, we need to meet. We uh, have something we, uh, we want to talk about, we're going to be an And so they show up in August. <laughs> and there was like this, uh, apparently this kind of black uh, thing over all the bombs and, and the, the Polish guy goes and like, look, we've been encrypting, uh, decrypting all the communication from the Germans for the past 10 years. And the French and the Germans just looked at it and thought the French and the British were just like, what? <laughs> They're like 10 years ahead of them. So it was really uh, a remarkable moment that would have been fun to witness if you were flying the wall. Um, but um, what they did was to say, okay, we think we're going to be invaded, judging from what we uh, inferred from uh, the rest of the world. Um, if you guys can continue some of this work, that'd be great. Here are replicas, and here are blueprints, and here are some spare enigmas that we constructed. Uh, there was like a, a very substantial effort that went into trying to reconstruct and, and uh, get all the messy details about an enigma machine because they didn't have a, an actual one. And so they shipped this to, um, to London via some playwright, so that it would cross suspicion. And then two weeks later, uh, Poland gets invaded by uh, Germany. And by that time, just at the nick of time, all this stuff that was at Buda Schiffer had been completely uh, wiped with evidence and destroyed, so the Germans never had any idea that any of this happened. Okay, so now our story kind of turns to a different country that was not at war. So what this goes to highlight is the fact that they had all this intelligence, but they didn't have an army. So it's kind of, you can't win a war with just intelligence. You also need something to be able to sustain uh, Hitler blitzkrieg in cases at your doorstep. So, but anyway, they made major advances in this decryption. Okay, so cryptanalysis moves to the UK. So they start a big uh, code-breaking operation at Bletchley Park, which is this place here. They have these huts, they have several hundred people trying to work on uh, decrypting ciphers. And uh, with this new kit from the Poles, they were now able to uh, create new bombs by the Rojewski uh, blueprint and decrypt communication for the uh, Air Force and the army of the uh, German military. However, they were not able to read Navy codes because the Navy submarines had a much more sophisticated device. They were much more structured in how they used it. They even had a reflector that rotated. It was just, it seemed impractical. Okay, so, but then they had enough uh, information. So now our third hero enters the picture. Uh, this is Alan Turing. And uh, it was one of the recruits in, in 1939. Uh, a couple of years earlier, he had published a paper on computable numbers, which had been lauded already at this time as being one of the breakthrough works, as it confirmed that um, you couldn't really uh, identify the set of questions. Essentially, he proposed that you could have something like a hypothetical machine, which was later called a Turing machine, that uh, would run any type of algorithm, but you still couldn't decide on particular types of problems. Um, so people saw this work and uh, and they decided that he needed to be recruited. And he would turn out to make major contributions to the other. He made five major contributions to the other. And I'm, I only have time to talk about zero of them, really. But, uh, <laughs> but I'll talk about one of them anyway. His first assignment 
was to think about this assumption that the Poles had made, which was the fact that everything that they were doing was reliant on the fact that the Germans were uh, transmitting their messages twice, right? They repeated it. And at some point, they were bound to find out that this wasn't the best thing to do. And so his assignment was like, what happens when you only get uh, messages that have been encrypted with just single messages? It's a really hard problem. Okay? So he had an insight, and we're going to describe that in a series of slides here. Suppose that we know what uh, suppose we know what the Germans are going to say. Okay, let's say that we just happen to have enough information about what we learned about them that this word or this place in a particular ciphertext is definitely the word weather or weather. We just happen to know this for a fact. We'll talk about why we might know this, but let's say that we know that this in fact was the encryption. Okay? Then we know that what happened was that the Enigma, just like before, was in a setting, and then you click the letter, you want to the next setting, setting S plus 2, S plus 3, and uh, to produce this. Okay? Now what he thought about was, okay, well let's again look for some sort of change, like Rajeski did. And so he noticed the following change. Let's see that W links to E. And then if we go to E again, it links to T, and T links to W, which links back to itself. So now we have this kind of curious change. It's kind of like, you just look at it and you're like, okay, so what, uh, right? Well, imagine you now had a machine that was trying to just figure out what possible settings of the Enigma could make it so that when I press W, I get E. And then I have another machine that just tries to figure out, okay, if I press E, I get a T. And then I have a third machine that goes like this. Okay, so far, have I simplified the problem? Not at all, in fact. I made it three times worse. I need to have uh, three machines trying to crack the code. But what I'm going to do, or what Turing did, was to think about, okay, I'm going to make them do this kind of in parallel, and I'm going to make them so that if I change uh, the setting of one of them, I change the setting of all of them. In fact, I'm going to make this machine here have some setting, and this one have that setting plus one. And then this machine here, that setting plus three, because that's where it is in this location. I'm going to, just going to draw it on a different slide here. So here's the first machine here. It's trying to translate W into E. It starts with some random combination here, uh, which we call S. There's another machine here that has the combination S plus 1, which means that we started at QCX instead of W. And then I have a third machine here that goes at uh, QZZ, because it's trying to correct T to W, and it was in the third position. Are you guys with me? Okay. So, so far, these are three machines, and they all kind of move in parallel. Now, here's the stroke of genius. So, you remember that we had this input machine here, and we had these scramblers, we had the reflector, we had a plug board, all this stuff. I'm just going to put it down uh, for every machine in these, uh, these colors here, okay? So, I have this for every single machine. So, I have a reflector, a scrambler, and a plug board, okay? So, now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run a current through this. I'm going to, in fact, look at this as an electrical uh, circuit. And what I'm going to notice is the fact that if I am able to put in a, uh, put in a W on this first machine and out comes an E, it doesn't, like, if this doesn't happen, then the circuit breaks. And I'm able to get the second machine to take in an E and out comes a T, and same thing for the last one, then I'm going to illuminate the light bulb. Okay. So now I just have a little circuit so that if I just happen to magically find the right setting, a light bulb goes off and I'm really happy. Okay? So this is what I, what I will do. Now the crucial thing about this is the fact that if you look at it, the fact that, the, the, that there's a reflector and it goes back so that if I type in a W and out comes an E, then if I type in an E just a moment later here, then it goes in the same exact location. If you think about this as a circuit, I could completely bypass the plug board. The same thing goes in and goes on. It goes, it translates to some letter L1, and that letter kind of gets just entered again. It cancels out. This is amazing. So, uh, in, in other words, he found another way to make the plug board settings of the Enigma completely irrelevant, just using this kind of a circuit. And, only Turing at this time could have thought of this, with his unique background in mathematics, in machines. He was not just a theoretician who was able to put it into practice and create this. Then he built this thing. So uh, effectively what he did then was to remove 
the blackboard again. And um, by this time, the scramble arrangements had been tenfolded from what uh, Jeffrey was dealing with. So we were down to one million combinations that we would have to check. Okay. So, um, so now the question is, how would we be able to guess that in fact Wetter was being uh, that, that this plain text here was in fact Wetter? Okay. This is something that uh, Turing called the crib. This is a known ciphertext. So I'm going to show you a little video about that. But it's the daily weather forecast that gives the British their first major breakthrough. Every day the Atlantic weather is broadcast from the U-boats, and every day it follows the same format. Wind speed, atmospheric pressure, and temperature. Seeing the same message layout each day gives Turing the idea of using what he calls cribs. Educated guesses to what at least part of the message might say. This is a cribbing journal of a weather forecast from the Bay of the Biscay region. The received encrypted message is placed against the German plain text. If any letters match up with themselves, S's as S's, B's as B's, then the crib is wrong. Notice that. The crib is wrong if you match for yourself because if I click an E on an enigma machine, because of the reflector, I cannot possibly go back to the E. So I can never map to myself. So this is actually I'm supposed to strengthen the, communication, uh, the encryption, but in fact it did the exact opposite. Okay, so if it matches to itself, it's in As enigma can encrypt any letter as itself. So they slide the message along until they find no matches. Pretty cool, huh? So if they know that the weather forecast is going to say there's nothing to report from weather in this location here, they can do, they, I mean, they have thousands and thousands of these messages. They know pretty much what it's going to say. They just look for this crib, and then they can construct the uh, circuit I talked about earlier. The circuit was, in fact, uh, a new kind of a bomb, and they named it again a bomb just to honor the, the Polish one. And they made a prototype in 1940 in March, and it was too slow. It took two weeks to find to decrypt the message. And so they worked on it, and uh, in the meantime, the thing that they were trying to prepare for actually happened. The Germans realized that sending these codes twice was, in fact, a security vulnerability, and they stopped it. So from May 1940, there was an information blackout for the analysts. They couldn't see what the Germans were thinking at the moment. And then, in August 1940, Turing produced a working prototype, which is called Agnew State. And um, here's a reconstruction of that. It's essentially something called a bomb. It's, it's like this uh, sets of machines that are just hooked up together, and they're trying all these different combinations. You can see that they're huge. There's lots of them. They're very expensive. They have to actually beg Churchill for money to, uh, uh, actually, they, they asked Churchill, just like, yeah, we were, kind of, we were low on budget, and we kind of need more money to decrypt stuff. Can we have money? And he's like, you will have any money that you need, and please report to me that these guys get everything they need. So they, they were on a favorable side uh, of Churchill at the time. So you can see here that there was an immense machine um, that they created, and you were able to plug into this machine what you thought the crib was, which might be wrong, like what you thought the matrix was, and then the encrypted machine, uh, they encrypted the ciphertext, and you would just have it run, and it would find uh, what it needed. So what did this mean for the war? Well, in 1941, the Allies were able to decrypt almost all German communications. Imagine that you were able to read the minds of everything that was happening in Germany, not just not just immediately close to Britain, but also the fact that they were about to invade Greece, or that there was something going on in Italy, and you could be like, hey, heads up, uh, you shouldn't go there. Um, so, um, and it was also um, Turing, among his, his many things that he did in the war, he also worked on this naval enigma that nobody wanted to work on. In fact, he said that, yeah, I decided to work on it because I could kind of keep it to myself, there's nobody else working on it. And, uh, and so he, he worked on that. And uh, he found this statistical analysis technique that I'm still trying to fully understand, uh, which breaks the cipher. It's kind of a really neat uh, thing that he did there. It's called the Banburius, uh, Banburismus statistical technique. So he was able to break the naval cipher as well and plug it into the bomb. Um, and then in February 1942, the naval enigma code was again strengthened. And it was strengthened quite a bit so that you couldn't just plug it into a bomb. And so what Turing, so essentially what happened then was that the Alice again were able to see where all the suburbs were. And if you recall from your history lessons in 1942, there was a lot of Allied ships that were being sunk. It was kind of, kind of the Battle of the Atlantic. Like every month, 50 ships would be sunk 
by the Germans. They would have like this wool pack that go take uh, convoys and just sink them all. So this is kind of just like the statistics. You can see that there's a huge spike as soon as they stop having information about what the docks or the submarines. So there were four times more Allied subcommons sunk in 1942 than in 1941. So from um, so for a full year, this was the situation. And at this time, Turing decided to go to uh, the US, uh, where uh, the US Navy was also working on helping the Allies. And he um, uh, helped them upgrade bombs, so like essentially create these kind of machines that do the cracking at a much larger scale than they could do it by the park. But by the time this rolled out, they would finally be able to read nail and code again, because they were just able to decrypt almost instantaneously. And from that point on, all communication made by Germans in the war were decided. And the Germans never had any idea about this. And the Allies went through some serious uh, trouble to make that the case. So they would sometimes know that there were like 11 submarines, but they would give their bombers information about seven of them, or eight of them. And um, they would, every time they would confiscate a code book so that they'd be able to read codes, they would sink the boat, or they would, it was even like Ian Fleming, you know Ian Fleming, the guy who made James Bond. He had a mission that uh, was approved, but never actually uh, completed, called Operation Ruthless, which was to actually have like, um, to take a, a captured plane and like sink it in some, in some spot close to a German boat, and have, have like a lot of guys there like crying, Hilfe, Hilfe, or something, have a boat come over and then move into the boat and steal all the code books. That was a mission of the, the creator of James Bond that only come up with, I guess. <laughs> but uh, it was actually never actually carried out, and it was, uh, it was when they were still unable to read the naval code. So we can see that Turing made massive impact on the deciphering uh, uh, problem at Wesley Park, and thus on the war. So the question is, did he really win the Battle of Britain, or is that kind of a dramatization that I added here? Well, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, the war is so complex. There's so many factors. There was, there they got, uh, the British got long-range planes, and there was all sorts of things. The GDP production of Germany versus Britain was different. The US had entered the war. You can't really predict whether or not something would have changed if you had changed one further. But you can say that Turing's work did influence some major important events. For instance, the Battle of Atlantic that I just told you about was completely shifted by the fact that the Allies knew where uh, the submarines were. And Britain, being an island, is very dependent on having convoys with supplies and stuff come back and forth. And this thing called Ultra, which is really this intelligence gathered by Leslie Park and by the team of Gold Rivers, was pivotal for deciding on D-Day plans because by the time, like by the time they had D-Day in they knew everything about the Germans. They knew where all of their uh, all of the troops were. In fact, they had such a good catalog that they joked that the German officers could just call Leslie Park to get their orders faster than they could <laughs> using the German means. It was very effective. Um, so uh, most people agree that D-Day happened in 1944 because of this intelligence and would have been deferred until 1947 or 1948, by which time Hitler and uh, the Nazis would probably have V weapons, V weapons and uh, some other things, and you couldn't really predict what would happen. So what um, Churchill said, for instance, that it was thanks to Ultra that we won the war. And uh, most historians do agree that this intelligence that was gathered significantly shortened the war and thus saved lots and lots of lives. So this is a very important contribution here. And Turing was at the heart of this. Of course, Rajevsky's contribution shouldn't be neglected, and uh, I think you should get all the credit for sure, but Turing was one of these guys that really um, made a huge impact. So what did this mean? Well, he made all these contributions, and then the war was over and so forth. Shouldn't he get a medal? Well, of course you should get a medal, and same thing for Rajevsky. But uh, instead, um, the co-breaking work that happened was classified by this top secret for the longest, and um, you couldn't really say anything, not even to your wife or anyone, that you had been working covert. And this is one of the most successful secrecy uh, institutions ever, because nobody even knew that Leslie Park existed outside of Britain, uh, even within Britain. Like most, uh, like the people are on uh, touring and all these other people, like you should be in the war. Why are you just sitting in an office somewhere? And you're just like, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like nobody knew anything, and that was true for three decades until 1974. Nobody knew about this. It's amazing. Um, and then in 1952, a few years later, after Turing had done some amazing uh, uh, contributions in other fields, which will be discussed, I guess, in this lecture series, he was prosecuted for being homosexual, which was illegal. It was uh, reporting a burglary, and they were like, 
And he said, oh, well, I was, I was hanging out with my boyfriend or something like that. And they're like, oh, what did you say? And they prosecuted him for being homosexual, forced him to undergo a hormone treatment, like injected estrogen into his body, and he became so depressed that in 1954, one of the greatest minds of our history committed suicide at age 42. And that's essentially the record. But by this time, nobody really knew about his contribution to the law. They knew about his um, uncomputable, uh, like his, his touring machines and all these other things, but this contribution remained completely secret. And they even, like, by the, uh, when he was prosecuted, they revoked his security clearances and all this stuff. It's really a sad way to treat uh, one of your private mates. In 1974, the book, The Ultra Secret, was published. And this is the first account of what happened during the war. You can, you can see why they kept this secret for so long, because of what happened with the Zimmerman debacle in the First World War. And then they published this proud book in 1923 that then made the Germans up their Yankee. So they wanted to defer this for as long as possible, but this is when all the people at Bletchley Park and all these uh, code breakers, you know, 7,000 people working there, could finally talk about what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis during the entire war. And they could finally be like, forgiven from their families for not taking part in the war, not being on the battlefield like a true like Britain or hero or something like that. And they kept some of the recognition that they uh, deserved. So for some it came too late, but... Uh, but uh, at last, there was uh, some sort of peace for them. Rzewski, which uh, I haven't talked about now since uh, we left Poland, he actually fled to France and then to Britain, and was actually working on deciphering some very menial ciphers, like very like clerky stuff. Um, and he, only in '74, learned that his techniques had been used to decipher the, encrypt the, uh, the enigma for the entire world. He had no idea, and I don't know why they would have this guy, this bright man, working like clerk stuff every day. Essentially what happened was that all information was on a need-to-know basis. People probably didn't even know about the Polish involvement outside of the circles that were just doing encryption. So it was kind of interesting that he would learn this just many, many years later. Anyway, so uh, I'm, I'm over time, so I'm just going to end. I'm just hoping that this kind of talk serves as some recognition for these types of things that uh, Turing and other great minds in history have contributed. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, why, why would a reflector not allow a, a letter to be encoded into itself? Well, with the reflector, the refractor, the, the way it was composed was that there was no, uh, there was no shortcut to yourself. There was always a wire going from A to B. And this was done intentionally because they would feel like, well, if I type an E, then I, can, I shouldn't get E back. This would be bad for security, right? There was a lot of this actually during this, I quote, but that you would think that somehow you should, essentially they thought that some probability had memory, right? That like if you did something that like, oh, uh, I saw something, uh, like, uh, saw these letters too often, that wasn't good. So for instance, uh, they would, uh, I, I, like for the day keys, they would never use the same day key, uh, they wouldn't even use the same letters in the day key the following day. Or, or the scramble orientations, like if you have these five wheels, you were unable to, well, actually, they up, to, up to, to like eight wheels. When they were using three wheels, they were unable to use that the following day. And of course, that meant that you would just divide by half, like all the things that you could try. There was also that you could never um, have uh, a key, like when you were entering like a, a key on the uh, keyboard to serve as a message key, you could never click a key that was adjacent to it. That was insecure or something. Of course, that also decreases the combination. There's a lot of this kind of misunderstanding about probabilities, including from Serbius, that was then exploited by the uh, code breaking. Thanks. Another question? Yeah. During any codes for the This is a very good question. Did during make any codes for the? Yes, I'm, I'm repeating the question. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to repeat the question. <laughs> and, um, so, uh, so the question is, uh, no, if I can remember, um, was, did Turing make any codes for the Allies? I'm not aware that he did, but it's actually very important to point out that we always focus on kind of this Allied war effort, this kind of this biased historical perspective. The Germans actually had a number of the deciphering agencies, but they were so scattered, it was so, it was like the EU, kind of, like there was like no communication going on between different agencies, so they never had any momentum. There was one agency called the Beat Bench, or something like that, that was able to, at, at some time, decrypt 80% of Allied communications. So in fact, the, the ciphers that the Allies were using were no more secure than the Enigma. And um, 
but they also were aware that it could be decoded, which is something that the Germans always thought was unthinkable. Like it's unbreakable in this machine. So at some point, like after like twelve submarines were down in a single go, they were like, "Is it possible that uh, that the machine is not secure?" And they're like, "No, no, no, not possible. There must have been a spy or something." Like there were all these like there, there were all these reasons invented uh, for why the machine was secure. But uh, the fact that they were able to read eighty percent of the communication is not exactly true because it happened only ten percent of that happened in due time to take action. It took them longer to do the decryption. And so the mechanized decryption process was this natural response to the mechanized encryption process, uh, which is kind of what the important contribution of this team and Turing really was. And that's something that the Germans did. That's a good question. Any more questions? On this point, yes. you know, I seem to recall that the, uh, the Goldman. Yes. I mean, this one here? Yeah. The police mentioned that actually in Bletchley Park, they uh -huh. essentially discovered RSA. Aha, uh -huh, this is a very good point. Um, that was a few years later. Um, so this code-breaking, uh, the, the Wesley Park was essentially disbanded after the war, but there was some work being done there still after. And they were thinking about, well, how do we actually make a proper, uh, a proper cipher or a proper encryption technique? And so they went on and they, they discovered that they could use primes and modulus, and they discovered something that was effectively this very same thing as RSA. And that was like 20 or 30 years before RSA even came out. So they actually did two contributions. They they did the um, the actual key exchange. They invented kind of the key exchange and the and the uh, RSA algorithm for doing it. And they never published the thing. But it wasn't until like far after RSA came out that they met with some people from the best department. Like, yeah, we we did that a lot. Well. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of interesting to see. But uh, it just shows also that if you have independent minds coming at the same conclusion, probably it's the right conclusion. Any more questions? No more questions? Last question, maybe? Okay, with that, I'll just say thank you very much.